everyone, welcome back today to another episode of Ten Thousand Rounds to Financial Independent.、Um, and today I have our guest Lika Tabita.、Um, and、uh, Lika is a、um, experienced in fix and flips. She has experience in fix and flip,、um, and also、uh, she's currently working on、uh, creating assisted living, residential assisted livings.、Um, and she's also、um, having goals to kind of set it. For a syndication, setting up a, her first syndication,、uh, Lika has a successful real estate network、um, called the Real Estate Connect, right?、Um, Lika,、um, and then so she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. What is fascinating about Lika is、um, the fact that she was a W two job, which is day job、uh, holder, just like me,、um, and、uh, she has later. Transition out of that and taking the leap into、uh, entrepreneurship. So this is really amazing, and we're going to share her journey、uh, going from fix flipping to you know buy and hold and then switching her investor mindsets today.、Um, Lika, very well,、um, welcome today to our show. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you for having me today. Awesome, and Lika has been introduced to me、um, in the local conference, I believe, in the Northwest. She also lives in near Seattle,、uh, as I am,、um, and so we kind of go way back.、Um, and so I'm very in,、uh, excited to interview her today and uncover some of these stories. Like all our show starts, Lika,、um, we started with a question about、um, if you have to think back. The one most influential person to your multiple person people to you、um, that kind of helped shape your entrepreneur、uh, mindset as they are today.、Uh, who would you say it is? And tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So you know, I grew up in India, and in India, you're a, in a very sheltered community, especially as a girl. But it was my mom that always pushed me to think outside the box, to go get a job. Uh, to not be complacent, and she's the one person that I would say instilled that entrepreneurial spirit in me. That's awesome. And so, for her, when you grow up, like, did she also kind of walk the walk as well? Like, was she an entrepreneur as well? Unfortunately, no. She was a homemaker. She had three kids, and that was like full time for her. Um, and so, like, but she had always、mm-hmm. the lofty goals and aspirations, and she kind of put those on us to go achieve for her. So,、yeah. you know, she showed us so much by way of not being able to do those things. Yeah, yeah, got it. So some sometimes of seeing her situation and、um, and then having the encouragement doing that. So tell us a little bit about the journey. You know, coming from India to here, how did you end up in you know the Northwest? Yeah,、um, so I grew up in India, and when I was 24, I met my husband who lived here, and so when we got married, I moved here,、um, and so he's the one that really was my forcing factor to move here. I was very happy in India. I had my friends, my family, my work,、um, and so it was kind of like gut wrenching to have to move, but I still did that because I was like. Let's go see what this new adventure looks like, you know.、Mm-hmm. So when I moved here, I, you know, started working at Nordstrom Corporate right away because that's what I did in India was a strategy in fashion merchandising,、mm-hmm. and so a good transition. And luckily for me, Nordstrom is headquartered in Seattle, and so it was、yeah. an easy transition. And I was in Nordstrom for a good seven or eight years before、mm-hmm. the the entrepreneurial bug came back to bite me, and I was like. I have to go do something, you know, cool and exciting for me that I'm excited to like wake up every day and say, okay, I'm gonna kick butt today.、Mm-hmm. I'm gonna、yeah. make a difference. I'm gonna build towards my legacy. I'm gonna do something. Right. That thing, right. Yeah. And that's kind of like what happened, and that's、um, the whole reason I picked real estate was it just gave me the freedom to do so much more than I had at my. W two corporate job. That's awesome.、Um, so you graduated from probably、uh, college. You probably went through the whole、um, 
you know, as Asians, we always, our parents is uh, basically putting us as engineers or, you know, financial related or doctors or dentists. These are pretty much the only options. Um, So you, you went through that like a conventional path per se um, as uh, uh, in the traditional Asian family. Um, And so you went to college and all that stuff. So the only thing that kind of really throw you off over there was that the fact your husband is moving over here and all of a sudden there's a big shift over there. Um, it's amazing. I found, um, you know, immigrants like us uh, get to deal with these um, uncertainties very well. And that kind of builds into uh, taking the risk in terms of like translate into entrepreneurship. Um, so you were, so tell us a little bit more about you were doing Nordstrom. Uh, and by the way, I always love how Leica dresses. And she was fabulous at that time. Um, and then, so now it kind of makes sense. <laughs> she worked at Nordstrom for a while. Um, so you were working in Nordstrom. Describe to us like a little bit about, you know, obviously there's some assignment when you first got the job. And then so then later on, like after eight years or so, you said, um, you know, what, what happened over there, you know, um, that made you had more the desire to kind of break free from, from yeah. the day job. Yeah. Yeah, I actually it was um, for a long time, I wanted to quit working for someone else and just do something on my own. I never thought it was going to be in a field like real estate that I had no experience or background in. Um, and so when I was at Nordstrom, I always looked at other opportunities like launching an online marketplace for fashion or like joining like a small fashion startup. Like I didn't know what it was going to be, but it wanted it to be something mm-hmm. um so as i was um we built our primary residence with a builder and that construction process mm-hmm. got me really excited about just building homes mm-hmm. um and so i said okay while i have my day job at Nordstrom, why don't i go find a lot and build a house mm-hmm. and so i started researching that and then soon i found that it would be impossible to do that as a hobby Mm-hmm. So I'd have to quit my W2 to do that full time. Wow. And also if I were to actually go into construction, then it would take me a lot longer to realize a paycheck uh, mm-hmm. rather than just, you know, I didn't know that the, the concept of fix and flip even existed. Yeah. So it was through my research on new construction that I discovered it. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay, uh, why not quit my job to give this my all and give it a mm-hmm. good shot? And if it does work out, then I'm not ever going to go back to corporate. But if it doesn't work out, then I'm still young and I can go back. I can make the switch back. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gave me that leap of faith to like say, I'm going to quit and I'm going to give this full, like go into this full time. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I did. That's awesome. And how did your husband react when you first decided that? Oh, he was completely on board. He was like, yeah, you know, um, he knew how much work I was just, you know, putting in at Mm -hmm. one time. And I mean, you don't make a great paycheck, you know, and so he's like, if, if there's another like field or opportunity that allows you to elevate your lifestyle and elevate your, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, life, then do it, give it a shot. And, awesome. you know, I, I had the support for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you did, this is very different than some of the uh, people that we have interviewed where they kind of do a slow gradual increase in terms of the point, break points, and they just do it. It's a totally a leap of faith uh, coming from that. Um, so tell us a little bit more about after three months of you quitting your job, the stuff that's kind of going through your mind and the transition that you have to go through uh, to get used to your new norm. Oh my God, I think it was the hardest because it's like you're literally creating something from nothing. You don't have a roadmap to follow. You don't know contacts, you know. I was super entrepreneurial in India, Mm -hmm. but I also had a huge network of family and friends and vendors. But moving to a new country, I didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. Like the only people I knew were people in my sphere, my friends. Uh, which were not a lot, you know? And so I'm like, okay, how do I go and create this for myself? Mm -hmm. So what I did those first few months um, of quitting my job is network. Mm -hmm. I would look up Craigslist and see who was in real estate investing and like call those people like wholesalers, retail, like uh, real estate brokers. 
I would network with escrow agents. I would mm-hmm. literally network with anybody that was willing to give me some of their time. That's and awesome. that's kind of what, you know, ended up happening is I just said, okay, let's just go for it and network. And I met some super cool people that were all of the growth mindset and they like mm-hmm. brought me in on their projects. I walked different flips. I spoke to different lenders and that's kind of how I landed my first flip Mm -hmm. and the rest is history. That's awesome. So you mentioned about the networks that you have uh, maybe, you know, three top tips to kind of share with our, you know, uh, viewers who want to kind of thinking about uh, going into uh, this venture or having their own entrepreneurship. So where do they even start with networking and then some of the top tips you can share? Yeah, I would say go, you know, go and meet up and find your local meetups. Um, the, the good thing that came out of COVID is telecommunication. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you could actually, you don't have to network with just your local meetup. You can find a topic you're interested in, go see people that are actually hosting meetups based on that one topic mm-hmm. and go attend virtual Zooms or webinars. Mm-hmm. Um, through COVID, like I literally grew, I had, I had no LinkedIn a year ago. Mm-hmm. So one year ago was when I exactly today, one year ago was when I started really, you know, diving into LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And so I have now grown my LinkedIn network to about 2,500 people over wow. the last year. And it's meaningful connections. It's not just like, hey, I want to be a virtual assistant. I mean, nothing wrong with that, but it's not all that. Like, you know, it's mm-hmm. like good, meaningful connections. And that's because I've been on people's podcasts. I've been on virtual networking events and I've connected with these people. Right. Mm -hmm. And that makes a huge difference. So honestly, um, you can do so much from the comfort of your home right now Mm -hmm. that I would encourage you to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Like I said, I always like a row up. Like yesterday, me and my partner had meetings. We're all in pajamas like the whole day. Yeah. Um, (laughs) yeah. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Um, so, so that's awesome. That's amazing. Alika, you have a online virtual meetup that happens every month. Can you share with us uh, what that is and the content for that? Yeah. So it's called Real Estate at Work and you can find us on meetup.com. You can find it on my LinkedIn, on my um, Instagram. And what's cool about this meetup is every month, we open it up. It's not like a webinar, but it's more like a networking meetup. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple different speakers that I interview. um, And these are amazing speakers. Like I had Ken McElroy on, I had Yona Weiss, I've had Kaylee McMahon, Mm -hmm. I've had Tarly Arbor, Sean Katona, AJ Osborne, um, Ashley Wilson, like just amazing real estate investors speaking about all things real estate, everything Mm -hmm. from fix and flip to self-storage to passive investing to multifamily investing. So it is really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And what we then do is we network in little breakout rooms. So once we're done with the speaker session and Q&A, then we all go into little breakout rooms, like of four or five people. And then we network and we do that a couple of times. It's like speed dating, but like for real estate investors. So it's cool because you get to meet like a bunch of other people investors from like random locations across the US. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, And then I believe that's kind of transition from your before COVID time, you were hosting uh, a meetup kind of like that in person. And I've attended a couple of them. They were pretty cool, Um, but kind of extend it into a virtual, virtual world to kind of reinvent yourself during the COVID time. Yes, Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, And so tell us a little bit about um, getting back to fix and flip. Um, so you got into the fix and flip first. Um, if you were to advise someone who wants to do that switch, um, what would you say the most, I'm going to say top most important things that you would advise them to do uh, in terms of getting into that? Maybe before you get into that, obviously you talked about networking, uh, probably some educations as well. Um, and then after you get into it, um, what would you say like a, one of the best piece of advice you would give someone who's starting that? I mean, yes, there's networking and education, but I think the biggest factor in whether you're going to be a success or not is mindset. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have the right mindset because there's, I'm not going to lie, this is not easy. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's not just your first flip or your second flip. The most money I ever lost on a deal was my 35th flip. 
Wow. And so, you know, things are not easy. Things are ever changing. And so um, go in with the right mindset that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. And no matter what happens, you're going to find the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a very awesome advice. Cause I think the most resilient part is the mindset. Um, and that's why I really admire people is coming from uh, not a lot of family backgrounds and then they made it themselves because they always know in the back of their head, they can do it, um, you know, because they did it so far and there's a, there's another ways to get up and going again. Um, and then you talked about the biggest loss on your 35th unit. So let's kind of dive into that a little bit more, but more so like the, the, the lesson that you learned from there and then what kind of things that you're putting in to prevent that from happening again. Yeah. So, you know, that I bought that deal from my very trusted wholesaler. So yeah. there was no like surprise there. Um, and when I bought that deal, I questioned the numbers, but I didn't question it enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked at it. I was like, hmm, that ARV just doesn't seem right. And so I reached back out to him and I said, what do you think? And he, you know, said like, look, the market's changing. We're going to hit that, um, you know, and this is the floor plan you want to follow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we did that, but what happened at that time is, I don't remember if you, you remember, but in 2018, there was like a little switch yeah. of the, you know, the market shift yeah, yeah, a little the market bit. Shift. and we kind of got hit with that, mm -hmm. but also it was in the city of Kirkland. Mm -hmm. So the location was fantastic, but the city of Kirkland permitting department was so rigid on me that they made right. me change everything, even if it didn't require changing. Wow. And that was just kind of nasty. And so the what should have been like a three month flip ended up being more like a seven month flip. It was only 1100 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, plus the floor plan was just not conducive to families. It was like a main bedroom and then two bedrooms on the upstairs. Yeah. Um, so it was just not the right, you know, uh, the okay. desirable floor Not plan. A desirable yeah. plan. Um, so I think going forward, like what I've done from that, learning from that is just making sure. Um, and then you learn this on every project you do, right? You learn yeah. something new from Absolutely. this project. I think for me, it's always about keeping the floor plan more versatile mm -hmm. um, and then making sure that I'm not overspending on the rehab if I can help it. Yeah. Uh, I think eventually we did a super, like this house turned out so super cute and I'm yeah. proud of the product I put out. But at the same time, I made a huge loss. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, that's just cost of doing business. Yeah. Yeah. It's a learning. And then plus like the 34 a successful project in, in front of it, you know, not letting that kind of letting you, letting you down, but a lot of good lesson learned from there um, in terms of it just, just so much packed information there um as in like a market shift so be in tune of that as well um also obviously the permit process you can't really help it um but um the increasing the margins and etc um that's amazing so you must have a system in place uh when you're fixing platin how many how many do you do a year like a, the peak of it now i know you kind of ease it off a little because now become a, just a hobby um <laughs> you know uh, how many volume do you kind of do with the fix and flip? I mean, I've done 12 in a year. And these yeah. are, so my flips are not cosmetic remodels. They're not like paint carpet, put it back on the market. Yeah. They're more intense. They're more mm -hmm. like take them down to the studs, do all new electrical, plumbing, seismic retrofitting, engineering, mm -hmm. architecture. So it's like everything from construction, process, yeah. like the works. Yeah. Um, and so doing 12 of those in a year, that was just like me pulling my hair out. Yeah. Um, and running in every direction and you know how our city is so vast like yeah i once did a flip in the northwest south and east of seattle oh dear god it's like a driving nightmare logistics yeah. right the traffic I, really puts, <laughs> puts the traffic, a truth yes yeah, literally west seattle went in uh shoreline and redmond so mm -hmm. it was everywhere and i was just like I am never going to do that again. Yeah. You know, because yeah. now I'm like super picky about where I find my projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just say, you know, like just be really picky. And, mm -hmm. um, and I scale that back. And now I do clips because I like it and I enjoy it. And mm -hmm. I can do one a year, I can do two a year. But like, 
I'm always making massive returns. Um, yeah. My last trip sold for 150k over ask. Yeah. Um, and so I don't need to do as many. I just yeah. get and do like one or two. Yeah, quality over quantity. Um, yeah. So as you kind of ramp down on the flip, tell us a little bit more about you transitioning to kind of buy and hold investing.、Uh, what is the kind of mindset shift over there?、Um, yeah. What was that kind of aha moment that happened? Oh, that's a great question because it was an aha moment,、um, Elisa. Ever since I met you, you've been harping on the buy and hold strategy. You're like, buy apartments, buy in B, C, D class, like right. That's what you always say. It's like buy these apartments and just make、um, passive income. And I never understood that, right?、Mm. Um, so in 2017, I met with Tatch Wen. And Tash is just like this amazing inspiration now turned Instagram sensation. <laughs> and、uh, Tash sat down with me at a luncheon, and when we were talking, he just said something so simple yet so powerful.、Uh-huh. He said, "Anything you buy, make sure you hold because、mm-hmm. there's only that much inventory." Right. And I was like. Hmm, I never thought about that because till then everything I bought, I bought to fix and flip.、Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to make a conscious effort to now start holding properties.、Mm-hmm. So do I still do flips? Yes, but I have, you know, transitioned to buying more multifamily deals and holding them.、Mm-hmm. So now what I do is I buy like three units, convert them to five, or buy four units, and revamp the whole building.、Mm-hmm. Um, And then this way, I can get like really good loans on them and just positive cash flow.